invite you to think about why do you think the spell worked? What about what you did? You know, you don't need to write it down, but think about what, what part of it, uh, what made this spell work and, uh, and another one not? What was, it, what was it particularly? If you can start to identify what, what the effective elements are of your spells, you can really begin to hone in and get your spells working marvelously. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, today's the bloat. Everybody's got a chance to brag about their best spell or right, whatever right. you'd like to brag about. Now, so, today's, today's spellcasting bragging 101. Right. So, uh, a little bit about the bloat. Now, this was originally introduced to me, actually, on the island of Okinawa because I happened to have some heathen friends in the army uh, who this was one of their preferred rituals. And they actually got together for a bloat every Sunday. And it usually took place after uh, a community flag football game. So there was always plenty of things to, to bloat about. or gloat <laughs> right. about because they had just played a sporting event together. Right. So, you know, it, it seemed pretty natural. Um, the purpose of this bloat is very much the same. I want to hear the highlights of your magical year. Um, now, the way a bloat works is everybody is supposed to get into class of their favorite intoxicant. I am having the legendary tippy talk in my cup, hot water. <laughs> and I'm going for the ice water. <laughs> He's going for ice water. Okay. Uh, but the idea is that everyone stands up and you get a minute to talk about yourself to everyone the way you talk to yourself in the mirror on your best days. And the best part about the bloat is everyone cheers and applauds and is happy for your success. And I think this is the most critical part of the bloat because you see in our, in our culture of late, it has become uh, impolite to gloat or to brag. brag about yourself, to be happy with yourself uh -huh. almost. I, I think this is a, a, another CIA mind. And so, really i want you to brag about yourself i want you to feel good about yourself because so much of our magic boils down to our ability to conjure up feelings and emotions and the feeling of pride now that is an that that's a feeling that has been very much downplayed in our culture that i would like to resurrect there's absolutely everything in the world good about, about being proud of yourself about being proud of the good things that you do and of being proud of the people that you associate with. Exactly. If you're not proud of the people that you're associating with, if, if you don't feel elevated in their presence, why are you in their presence? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, let's hear some more, let's hear some more show off stories. I really, we, we got one here from Freya. Oh, good. I heard if I helped a friend find work, I asked three totally different things. So I had a choice. He got three totally different things, but he had a hard time deciding what he was going to do. I'll never do that spell again. Why not? <laughs> you should certainly do that spell again. It sounds like it worked three times. <laughs> you might want to also add something about discernment there. So it's going to be a little easier to make up your mind or that you're going to get cl very clearly which one right. you should do. And this is where divination comes in handy. Right. And that's something that we really haven't taught in, in this course. Spell working is, is, of course, been purely about how to make things happen. Right. It's, it's actually quite important to sort of hone in on the success of your spells as well, to have an idea of how the outcome is going to be ahead of time. Yeah. So we're talking about spells over the past year and what your most successful spells were. This is a chance to brag today. Right. And it doesn't have to be spells to do with the class. What has been your most successful piece of magic? Right. Right. Exactly. Um, Haha. <laughs> uh, I have I have a banishing spell I'd like to to share with you. This is for banishing unpleasant neighbors. Um it's it's uh it's one one word really, uh maybe two at most. And uh I've used it on my neighbor quite effectively. I have a nosy neighbor and um oh she's just constantly Actually, one day, I kid you not, we had this conversation. I am driving by very slowly because it's a gravel road, driving, driving, driving. I see neighbor, annoying neighbor, waving me down. Oh, annoying neighbor, wants my attention. Oh, 
fine, whatever, roll down the window, <laughs> slowly drive over to annoying neighbor. Yes. And she says to me, I just want to let you know, I love watching your owls and I got a new pair of binoculars. So if you see me looking over at your place with binoculars, <laughs> I'm watching your owls. <laughs> Mrs. Like, Kravitz, we call her. <laughs> and it worked. I don't know if anyone remembers the <laughs> television series Bewitched. Of course, everyone knows with Bewitched. Samantha. Well, class, you remember Mrs. You Kravitz who used to always be sneaking up and watching everything <laughs> witchy that she was doing? Well, we got one of those. She was right across the street. Yes. We call her Mrs. Kravitz openly to her face. Yes, sir. She's always, <laughs> always spying on the witch. There's something very strange about her. Gladys, will you stop? No, I will not. It is time that people found out about this house. Oh, weird things go on in here. They have powers, supernatural powers. And and uh, I had I had some help in the yard just recently. And <laughs> she took this opportunity to take a nice stroll along my property line. Now, mind you, I don't have a fence yet. This is what the people who were in my backyard helping me with were helping me with is this fence because of this neighbor who just decided because to take it. Mrs. Kravitz. Mrs. Kravitz. And, and so when she came by, I said, oh, oh, look, Lyle, there's, there's that woman, Mrs. Kravitz. And he says, oh, you mean Lenny's mother? <laughs> and I said, I said, oh, no, honey, you remember that TV show? About the witch? Did yeah, it. there's my Mrs. Kravitz right there. <laughs> you know, I'm saying this. <laughs> while she's to, listening. Yes, while she's walking. Pretending like she's not hearing. She couldn't have been but more than 25 dropping. feet from me. And still, you know, doesn't say hello, doesn't nod, doesn't wave, doesn't acknowledge my presence, doesn't acknowledge the fact yeah, that Yeah, that's kind of the downside. Hey, we have so much privacy out here. We were out in oh. wide open nature. I mean, there's so many wonderful things about living here. We have hardly any neighbors, but the ones that we do have, well, <laughs> just, eh, there's one that's a little bit weird. Yeah, Mrs. Kravitz. Mrs. Kravitz. But she's, I think... She's a, she's a piece of work. But I think that must be evidence that this is, in fact, a dream. Because what else could it be? I mean, I watched Samantha on TV growing up, and she was a blonde witch living a pretty middle-class life with, you know, kind of a, <laughs> a Darren-looking husband. Oh, God. <laughs> And then across the street, I've got Mrs. Kravitz. <laughs> <laughs> now, Cynthia says, I've had a lot of luck with cave painting spells. Right. Now I carry around a special notebook and use it to draw and cast spells when I am out, like getting the parking space I want and things like that. It works every time. That's wonderful. Fantastic. Okay. Now, that being said, Cynthia, would you happen to enjoy the genre called anime? <laughs> Because if you do, I have a treat for you. There is an anime called Death Note. Uh, Netflix just recently released, released a guy who gets a notebook from another realm, and in it, it gives him control of life and death on Earth. And it's how he uses the power of his magic notebook. So it's which, interesting because you're developing a, a power very much similar to his. Yes. With your magic notebook. And, and this is why I love anime so much, because, you know, the powers that be are always telling us that TV is not real so that the things that they put on TV, we are conditioned to disbelieve so they can put the truth out in our faces and then laugh because we don't recognize the truth. And that's specifically true about magic and anime within magic, because I have found that the anime genre by far is the best uh, entertainment training ground for people who are interested in spell casting you can get some great ideas. And now that you have actual spell casting training, you are going to be able to sift between the actual usable magic and the anime fluff. And that's, that's really, that's gonna be such a great tool for you. Uh, another movie you should watch is Doctor Strange. Have a look at Doctor Strange. Think about how he's manipulating energy and Okay, yeah, he's got all these groovy geometrical figures. Fantastic. What is a pentagram but a geometrical figure? Right. So, <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's the same principle. Mm. Now, um, Cynthia, I'd like, before we move on, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about this. So I'd like you to reflect a little bit about this as well. Okay. What is it about making those drawings, like you were making the cave paintings in your cave, 
that's getting you those results. What is it really? What is the mechanism? I mean, you know, we, we if you boil it down to its least common denominator, is it because you're putting pen to paper? Is it because you're doing something? Is it because you know, you've got what, the right time of day you, or, or you're symbolizing something that, that, you, that you want and you're manifesting it in that way? What is it exactly at the very bottom of things that's causing things to happen? Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, once you can identify that one important key. Now, in this case, it might not be either. I'm not looking for, oh, it was that aspect of, of, of spell worker. It was this particular mm -hmm. principle of, uh, of symbol and, and a representation. No, there's an energetic component that she's tapping into. That right. She can identify the source of the energetic component powering the spell. And exactly. she has the key. Exactly. Exactly. And where is that energetic component to be found? Da, 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 da inside of you, Cynthia, because at the bottom of things, what is causing things to happen is your magical will. You're beginning to discover your magical will, how simple it can actually be, because the more that you master your magical will, the simpler your spells can be. Right, exactly. <laughs>
you're actually in, in increasing the manifestation power of your words and of your strong intention by bringing emotion into the right or the spell or whatever it is that you're doing when you're casting. I mean, by bringing that strong emotion in to fuel your spell, you are using your magical will skillfully. So it's not just a question of willpower, it's a question of skill as well. I recently had a birthday and I decided that I wanted to go to the beach for my birthday. I haven't been to the beach in 15 years. And I decided wow. it was time that I, I was back in the salt water because I very much miss Okinawa some days. And so I started casting a spell to get myself back on a tropical beach. And the way I cast the spell was I cast it so that I would be sure to get it. And so what I did is I buried the desire of the beach underneath a couple of other layers that uh, of things that I wanted along with it that would make it easier for the trip to happen. Um, I don't want to be too specific because it will, uh, it'll give too much away. Yeah. It's, sometimes you have to keep your spells, <laughs> the actual spells, but tell us about the results. Okay. This is the part so, everybody wants to know. <laughs> okay. So the results worked really well and I got to go to Aruba. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I I went snorkeling in Aruba. It was great. Bermuda, Bahama, come on, pretty mama. And I also got to I go swimming in some other places. And um, the swimming happened how on a cruise ship. Yep. It was a cruise, and I had never been on a cruise before. And you know, a cruise seemed like a good idea too, because you know that was a way to to do some traveling and some sightseeing without having to do any driving, which, you know, don't get me wrong. I love to drive because I'm a bit of a car aficionado. And so, <laughs> you know, I like to drive nice cars because I like the way the engine feels. And right. boy, the engine on this cruise ship was enormous. <laughs> it was great. And, you know, not only did you have the sound of the waves, against the hull of the boat all night but you all just had the, grrr, the grinding of the engine and the movement of the boat and it was just it was fantastic it was like uh it was like riding on the back of a giant beast the whole because you know the whole thing felt alive under your feet it was it was really fascinating and uh i got a cruise for my birthday i mean and and <laughs> and, and and this came at a time when we're a bit strapped for cash because of the fact that, you know, when she came to me with the idea of wanting to go to this and wanted to go on a cruise, it's like, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, we're, we've got three different projects in production right now. So we're like, and we're expanding and re, re, rebuilding the Golden Dawn Funnel. So it's like got all of this stuff going on with the expansion of our business. And it's like, there's no way we could do this right now. And But so, my prosperity doesn't work with cash. When, when I get prosperous with things, it doesn't, it doesn't arrive like it arrives for him. You know, him, it's really easy. You know, there's numbers, you know, with me, it's more qualitative stuff. Like, um, she's a very good <laughs> spell master. Well, like the other day I went to the hardware store. I bought an air filter. I forgot it. I left it. I went back to the hardware store. I said, hi, do you remember me? I'm the goofy lady that forgot the air filter. And they said, Oh, you sure. We held it back for you. Here you go. He handed me a two pack instead. And you told him it was a one pack. And he I said, told no, him it was a one pack. No, and he says, no, no, no. I was your clerk. I, I know this is right. You take these out of the store. And he like really insisted. He's like, you need to go take these. I'm like, okay. And, and I take my little air filters out to the car. Okay. And, and with the cruise? And it was the same thing with the cruise. It's the same thing. You know, <laughs> here we are about three and a half weeks ahead of the cruise departure time. And these friends call us and they are supposed to be booked on this cruise and they suddenly can't go. And there's all kinds of problems involved right. and us we couldn't stand in for them. And so we said, of course, gosh, <laughs> I guess we could. <laughs> oh, it would be so hard to the Bahamas. You said, <laughs> 
<laughs> really? <laughs> cool. And so, um, so that's how we got a cruise to the Bahamas because I wanted to go to the beach for my birthday. I think that's. And I, I, was I, I, think, actually, I think she wins the bloat today. I'm sorry. And and I will tell you, I was actually with my feet in the sand on my birthday. Right. In the water, looking at a tropical wow. <laughs> it was the best birthday ever. <laughs> really spectacular when when i was in okinawa yeah there was a certain time at guild meeting where sometimes it would just be me and yuki and a couple of other the other ladies and then we would get around to sitting around and telling stories and that's when it would get interesting because that's when got my route yuki. 66 coffee cup for this, part of the, for this part of the guild meeting so and that's when yuki's teacher would she'd come hobbling out she'd sit down she'd and then she'd start talking really low and really soft and really gravelly. <laughs> it sounds flat, that sounds about right. And then Yuki would say, oh, of course I'll tell the story. And then she would, I mean, that's all the little old lady would say. And then she'd just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> and then Yuki is <laughs> telling all of her stories. And um, the one that I brought up was the astral dog. Um, somebody ran over a beloved dog in a neighborhood because it always barked. Well, that didn't stop the barking dog. The The ghost dog came back and kept barking. And now they couldn't really, really couldn't get the dog to start barking. And so they had to go in and do a special pet depossession to, <laughs> to get the astral dog from barking. And, you know, um, actually on the island of Okinawa, a couple of GIs had accidents because they had were swerving to avoid dogs that weren't there that really weren't there they were ghost dogs astral ghost dogs yeah the island of okinawa it's the veil there is super thin and stuff filters in and out all the time now freya asked about the talisman here um okay you know she's asking about if she should cover it with silk because she's made a talisman when she's doing her lbrs yes it's a good idea mm -hmm. because in your mind you know you're protecting the energy that are uh that, that that's in that talisman <laughs> <laughs> we got a really interesting story here from uh, from Nathanael I was taking a look at a second ago. Oh, okay. And I'd like to read it with the group. It's really yeah, quite yeah, nice yeah. here. <clears throat> Nathanael says, I remember a long time ago, you sent out a daily ritual when bathing, imagining a new, better person. Mm -hmm. When you said, when you sent that out, I wasn't in the greatest place. I was working in a negative work environment, master control operator. I noticed every day what people said on TV would impact culture. People would repeat things they heard on TV as fact. Mm -hmm. My boss was negative and would yell at me after work about something someone else did. I would do the ritual of a new and better person every time I showered. This was before the course a long time ago. The boss I have now is very positive and I'm not exposed to the ridiculous hyper suggestions all day at work. See? Bravo. That is Bravo. So that, good. You know, the, to hear stories like this warms my heart because you know it's such a simple ritual. You can do you, you can do such simple things that can be so powerful and make such a dramatic change in your life. Yes. Like, for example, um, anytime I'm feeling bad, I like to go in, hit the shower, get in the shower, close my eyes, and just imagine that I'm showering off in pure white light, <laughs> that I'm showering all of the gunk of emotional gunk off mental gunk off, anything that's feeling negative at all, just all the negativity just going down the drain together with the water. It's amazing how you can transform from that to that, just like that by taking a shower. Mm -hmm. This is actually an adaptation of an old Cherokee healing rite mm. where um, when someone was ill, they would lie down in a stream with their head pointed at the top and, and their feet downstream. And they would imagine that as the water is flowing down over them, chi, or we would describe it as luke's, luke's energy, mana prana, chi, is flowing like the water, but in through them and Beautiful. washing them clean. Right. And so what you visualize- So you clean inside and out. Right. The clean water coming in and muddy water leaving through your feet. Right. And that's a very easy visualization if you're in a creek, because when you first lay down, that's exactly the thing that happens. You lay down and it's always muddier at your feet than at your head. And so that's a very simple visualization to carry through. Now all you have to do is verticalize that. Now, instead of in a stream, you're mm -hmm. in a shower, but right. you're doing exactly the same ancient Cherokee healing rite that's been done on this land and in this area yeah. for 
you know, thousands of years because it's such a good traditional technique. Anyone it lying works. down in the stream would think of this. It works. I mean, and how well it worked for you. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and also the other thing about that is that the persistence that you showed in it. You might not have gotten results right away, but you just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And over time, you did get results. That's it's right. just anything that you do. If you just stick at it and keep persistent, you just keep knocking at it, knocking at it, knocking mm -hmm. at it, knocking mm -hmm. at it. And you're going to get what you want. Yes. Prodder Corey was talking about sigilized spells drawn on pieces of paper the size of a passport photo. He keeps them in his wallet. Mm -hmm. So if I need a particular spell to be cast... I just take out one paper, quickly charge it with middle pillar of Kundalini, mm -hmm. then burn the paper. If I don't have a lighter, I just uh, tap the paper with my index finger three times and visualize energy being released. This is the method I've developed and works wonders. Yes. You know, this, you, what you've done basically is you've created your own grimoire. Mm -hmm. and um, That's very clever. Yeah, you've created your own grimoire. And you will find that, you know, once you learn these sort of things, you'll find that, you can look at grimoires of the past with a different eye mm -hmm. because, you know, if you understand sigils and understand sigilization and things like this, why should you not be able to use any sigil in any grimoire in any place? And there are methods there. There are unpublished methods, but uh, that are in the RRDC, the second order of the golden dawn mm -hmm. about sigils and how to use them that um, actually make it possible to use the sigils of any grimoire without having to go through a whole bunch of uh, hoops and things, whatever the instructions are in the grimoire. Mm -hmm. A lot of times if with a whole lot of fasting and this and that and, and all of that, but you, you don't really have to go through all of that. You can simplify right. things a lot. Right. Um, and speaking of simplification, uh, one of the things that I've found useful is, um, you know, you're talking about having sigils in your wallet that you can use uh, on the spur of the moment. Um, Again, I'm going to go back to my anime examples because they rock. Uh, Bleach. I don't know how many of you have seen Bleach, but uh, one of the things, and, and I think it's pretty common throughout all of anime, one of the things that they do is um, there are elaborate physical spells, you know, like our LBRP. Right, right. Okay. That are summarized. Like when Doctor Strange comes up with all of those. He's throwing them. It's kind of like our LBRP. Right, right. But in this in this program, we use pentagrams. He use circular sigils. Right, right. So what I'm thinking specifically of is I made an adaptation of that when I was uh, first practicing Wicca, because I thought, okay, so I'm a I'm a college student. Oh, it takes me 15 minutes to cast a circle. Isn't there a faster way? And so I came up with one, and the faster way was. You ready? Mm hmm. Wow. And that's it. And then I would imagine around me, what it was stomp, witches, circle, right? Hmm, right? And in my mind, when I cast the witch's circle and I do this, all of a sudden it just pow, the stars, the the lines, the pillars, right. the associations, the tools, it all it's just It's the astral pops. version of the special place. Yes, it just pops right into place. Now, you know, I was talking yesterday to our Golden Dawn students in the Golden Dawn office hours a little bit about um, the importance of the magical persona. And, you know, we haven't gone into that too much here, but we, we yeah, we've, we've included a little bit of it in the course. But, you know, the whole point of uh, associating certain instances with a certain spell or a certain right. ritual that you're doing. Yesterday we're talking about the Rose Cross ritual with some right. rose, incense. rose incense. But all of these incenses and putting on fancy robes and setting up fancy altars and, and, and bringing on special music when you do a ritual, it's all about creating altered states of consciousness. And what you were talking about with this WC, Witch's Circle, mm -hmm. is that you manage to internalize your magic circle mm -hmm. with the magical persona that you built up mm -hmm. so well that all you had to do was stamp your foot and make a sign and you could, boom, bring the whole thing to life right there inside you. Yeah, and, and it was so neat because when I, I the very first time I did that in circle with um, my practicing group, I said, hey, guys, check this out. Watch what I just figured out because <laughs> hey, I was really excited about it. Hey, wait. Hey, what? Look over there. That's Mrs. Kravitz peeking through the window. Oh, for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do notice that when our shades are pulled, it's exactly the time that she needs to service her horse's manure. <laughs> We've decided we're not going to spare her anymore. We're <laughs> going to, Mrs. Kravitz is going to become a regular feature on all of our shows. 
Nathaniel says, was reading that any emotion can be used to charge any sigil, but couldn't that cause extremely undesirable results uh, because of sympathetic magic? <sighs> you yeah, know, you don't want to use anger to charge a love sigil. That's stupid. No, it's silly. You <laughs> want to use love to charge a love sigil. Exactly. I mean, you know, depending on the kind of magic that you're doing. Yes, yes, emotion, adding emotion to spells works. I mean, I don't want to talk so much about sigil magic, but, yeah. you know, any spell, adding emotion to any spell is a good idea. And yes. in, 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 including if the spell is as simple as prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, prayer works even for atheists, especially when um, when it's fueled by intense emotion. Like the old saying goes, there are no atheists in foxholes. Something I have noticed, though, is that um, chanting something over and over works just as good as emotion. Oh, so if, yeah, it, yeah, it's if, it, if it's something that you don't seem to be able to pull up a lot of emotion for, mm -hmm. for example, I am not as passionate about replacing my rat fink sister-in-law's barky dog as she is. She wants another little yappy mutt. You know, that's great. I'm glad, you know, good for her. But I, I don't have the same passion, even though she asked me to help with a spell for that. So I need to have a chant for that because I can't pull up the same emotion on her behalf for this dog. Cause I don't want the right. dog like she does, Right. but I still need to help her out with this energy because this is what she asked for for Christmas. So, right. so the way I work around that, my lack of, of passion for the, for the work is through a chant uh -huh. because that will energetically build up the same way in my body as, as emotion would. And, and the chant is simple. She gets the dog she wants and loves. She gets the dog she wants and loves. And I just sing this to myself while I'm dusting or vacuuming or something. So yes, any emotion can be used to charge to charge any spell or any sigil. Yes, you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends. You want to use emotions that are congruent with what you're doing as well, though. Mm -hmm. And um, there are reasons for that. I mean, we were talking about that a little bit yesterday. Mm -hmm. Esoterically speaking, there there are, are reasons why emotion particularly and visualization, you know, also repetition of mantra, like you were suggesting, mm -hmm. all of these things uh, will work. But the reason why it works, well, you could say the reason it works is because you're putting these impulses into the unconscious, mm -hmm. which is then causing these things to manifest. Right, right. Um, but if you're using an energy model, which I personally prefer for this, mm -hmm. this thing, you would say that. What happens is when you pray with intense emotion or when you're looking to something with intense emotion and you're visualizing something with intense emotion, you are causing your astral body to take on the form of what it is that you're praying for, what it is that you're looking at, looking for. You're actually manifesting it by molding your astral body through mm -hmm. that intense prayer and intense emotion right, right. Or, or repetition. Exactly. It's a, it's a, Esoterically speaking, we would say it's a function of the astral body. Hmm. I mean, it's an atheistic way of, of explaining why prayer works. There are some ceremonial magicians in here that would be better to talk about this in Golden Dawn. Remind me sometimes at, at, sometime okay. at office hours. But, you know, particularly when you start getting into ceremonial magic and you're doing longer rituals, mm -hmm. it is important that you do them precisely. Oh, yeah. But, but there's another side to that. Right. It's important that you do them precisely up to the point where spirit moves you and carries you into reverie of spirit. And at that point, things can and should emerge spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And you should reach a lyrical point in the ritual so that the spontaneous stuff is happening, moved by spirit. And then the ritual takes on real power. So it's not just empty forms. Mm -hmm. You need to get to that lyrical spot. Right. But it's like... And this is very much where the body becomes the instrument that the soul plays like an, like, like an instrument. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, there's a certain amount of scales. Do, 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 right, do. Exactly. You've got to practice exactly. your scales. You, you need you the grammar. You need to learn the grammar of the language. Right. Once, or the music. Yes. Once you have the scales down and you know that you're going to be playing this in G minor and it hits your solo, you know the G minor scale so well, you can relax and you can let the music flow out of you. Exactly. You don't have to concentrate on, I can't ever exactly. play an F sharp. Exactly. I can't you want to get to that point. You right. want to get to that point. You want to get to that, point. Get to that relaxation. And you have to practice. Flow. It's the only way. Over and over and over again. Because what you want to happen is you want the 
the rote forms to be taken over by the subconscious so that the consciousness can focus on the actual work being done. You learn the grammar so well that you don't have to think about it and you can begin to write poetry. How many times have you driven home from work and when you get into your driveway, you blink and you're like, okay, that was creepy. I really don't remember driving home. I know it's happened to everyone at least once because right. everybody drives home that tired at least once from work right. <laughs> or you don't work. <laughs> yeah. So that was your subconscious driving you home safely while your conscious mind was somewhere else because you have made that drive home so many times, so many times exactly. that your subconscious could do it for you. This is how you want your magic to work. Right. You want your, you want to be able to do these rituals literally in your on sleep. autopilot. Yeah. On autopilot. And then comes, you notice when something happens, something shifts in the ritual, you know, usually at the point of the intention, that's when you summon the emotion to launch the intention. And, and, and it's there that things can happen. If you watch it, if you're very attentive, you notice subtle shifts inside yourself mm -hmm. of consciousness. So with that said, we're going to close up and we'll see you next time. Bye. Next year is going to be this year. time. We'll Happy New Year. Again. Happy holidays. Yay.